Hi, and welcome to MentorCore. If you're new here, we're a community focused on helping people in the security, risk, and compliance fields grow their careers and leadership skills through mentoring. You can find more information about MentorCore at mentorcore.biz. I'm Dan Ayala, along with Lisa Beth Lentini Walker. Now, on to this week's discussion. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're here for another MentorCore, and we are joined by Eric Willie. Eric is the Chief Information Security Officer at American Axle Manufacturing here in Detroit, Michigan. And he's also the Vice President of the Detroit Chapter of the Cloud Security Alliance. He is also the co-host of the Great Security Debate podcast. Uh, I've heard this is a pretty good podcast, Eric, but uh, can you do you think you can recommend it to people? Is it worth people listening to? I would highly recommend it. It was That was kind of a, uh, but wait, there's more moment. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Eric. We're really excited to have you. Um, Eric and I have known each other for a long time and uh, both CISOs here in the, in the Detroit area, and we are co-hosts on that podcast. Um, we'll leave a link in the show notes if you want to go have a listen. Um, but, uh, but also, Eric is, you know, is a great leader in security, uh, a technologist turned leader, and uh, both a mentor and, uh, and, and a protege in places. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about just what's your backstory and how'd you get to where you are today? Yeah, it's a good question. So I don't, do we have enough time to go through all of the I was history? Born and, <laughs> on a snowy day. <laughs> <laughs> so it started on a crisp February morning. Now, so it actually, so it goes back to, to, I got my start while I was going to Oakland University. So at the time Penske was looking for an intern so if you recall the smart car, so Penske brought the smart car into the, the U.S. So they advertised for an intern. I was like, oh, hey, Penske's a cool name. You know, I didn't know anything really about the automotive side at the time, but everybody knows Penske for the, the race cars, right? And the yellow trucks on the, on the road. So decided I'm going to take a chance at that. Luckily, they gave me a shot. And then so as I was interning for Smart USA, so I was finishing doing my degree at Oakland University and then happened to notice at the time that Walsh became a center of excellence. So moving from the traditional MIS and looking at it, whoa, wait, there's now this whole security concept that instead of building things, I can now break them. Well, that's intriguing. So kind of mid shift moved over to there to, to finish my degree. And while I was still working at, at Penske, so I was there for 14 years. So switched degrees, moved over to Walls, finished bachelor's degree. And at the, around the same time, Smart USA had to go back to Daimler. So Mercedes needed them for the, the average gas consumption for the fleet. So at that point, moved back to the mothership. So Penske Automotive Group doing some project management, some development. And at around the 2012 timeline, so I decided to start my master's in information assurance. So again, over at, at Walsh, the decision was made that they were going to transition away from the dial-up credit card terminals. Yeah, we all remember those days and move to the, the on-network ones, which meant it's now in scope for PCI. So as part of PCI meant Penske had to start building their first information security program. So up until that point, it was kind of a piece of everybody's role. There wasn't a formal group that was taking that on. And just kind of raised my hand at that point and said, hey, I'm doing this whole master's thing, went through a bachelor's in information assurance, you know, you want to give me a shot? And luckily kind of got the tap on that one to start to be patient zero and building out that program. So 2012 started building that, added a couple of people, and then we took what we we did in the U.S. and then started scaling that into some of the other global operations, building it up over in the the U.K., Germany, uh, and then Australia. We had some businesses there that were built or that were bought and continued building the program. So that was the the 2012 was the inflection point on being able to to start that program. Fantastic. Very cool background. Um, so let me ask you really quickly, what's new in your world that you're excited about? Well, like I know that, you know, you guys like to geek out on the podcast that you do, <laughs> um, but what else are you excited about in your world? And it can be, you know, anything professional, not professional, et cetera. Yeah. It's, <laughs> can I say everything? It's the, everything the is awesome, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was good or everything is interesting at least everything is interesting hey, the 
beauty, the draw for me for security is there is no normal day. Every day there is something different. I've always likened this to, to playing sports, right? That I enjoy playing basketball, but it, it's to a point that if you continue to win and if you're playing against, you know, say I'm playing against my nephew and I win every time, it gets to a point where, yeah, it's fun because we're doing something together, but the competition is just kind of disappears, right? There isn't that, that draw. Security is not like that at all. We acknowledge running into it. The deck is stacked against us every day and we don't know what's going to come out next. I mean, I, I sitting here today and talking about what's going over on over in Europe. I mean, I don't think anybody would have necessarily predicted this and how it's changed the outlook and what we're looking at right now from our security programs. So it's continually in flux. And for me, that's I, maybe I thrive in, in chaos or something, but I really drawn to that. Uh, we definitely do in this field thrive on chaos, and you know there are those that run toward the incidents. You know when when are people when are people in information security most uh, most challenged? It's during incidents, but unfortunately, that's also nurtured a uh, an environment of uh, the hero culture and the firefighter uh, rather than the plan and build. You know the the design plan and and plan ahead mindset. So you know since you mentioned that, is how how are you? how are you bringing some of that culture, that mindset to your security program uh, and getting people off of the, um, the high intensity, high endorphin lifestyle that's been you know, most of my 25 years in the field? Yeah, I think for me, the, the focus is always got to be family, home life has to come first and acknowledging that with the team. And it's, it's good to say those words, but you also have to live those words. Right. So, and this is, this is one of the things, you know, as I look back through my history, if we would have been having this conversation probably 10 years ago, I wouldn't have figured that out. That would have been, well, I'm just going to keep working. I'm going to keep doing things. And then, you know, luckily my wife has taught me about setting boundaries and all of the, the goodness that comes with that. And you have to set those boundaries, right? You have to create those lines of delineation between the home life, the work life. Cause I, I mean, I, it's not specific to our field, but our field will consume you if you let it. There's always more there to do. There is 100%, <laughs> right? So you have to create, create those safety boundaries around your time. And it's really, that's got to flow through to the, the team. There's been times where we tell team members, stop responding to emails, go do something else. It's not healthy to stay checked in all the time. You know, and it, it's kind of this, it's counterintuitive, right? There, there's a point that, as leaders that we want to look at things and deliverables and tasks and go, well, I, I can't fail at anything. I, I've got to get all of this stuff done. I got to check all the boxes done. But what you realize is you start to actually mask underlying issues when you start doing that and you burn yourself out at the same time. There's only so much you can do and have to make sure that you are prioritizing what you're doing and everything else is it's back burner. You know, from it's a conversation within the, the organization these risks are taken care of. We've addressed these. This is what's still remaining. If these are still important, then we need to talk about, is it people? Is it changing priorities? Something else has to give to, to address those. Wow. Well, I, I mean, I think that's a very important conversation to have. The, the conversation around burnout prevention, um, rehabilitation from burnout, because it does seem like it's something that's been taking up a lot of um, space in multiple industries, whether it's information security, risk, et cetera. So, right. you know, as we think about the skills that are needed uh, to be a leader in the field, do you have to be technical to be a CISO and lead a team? And do you need to have other skills to be a leader for tomorrow beyond just technical expertise? Yeah. So I'm going to steal a line from Dan and it depends. Uh, so I, are you a <laughs> lawyer? Sure. I, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, so Lisa, actually, so I outed think... that my, my best phrase actually comes from attorneys. Shh, don't tell anyone, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's really true in this case. If you think about it. So Forrester, we talked about it on one of the podcasts, Forrester put out a good publication looking at this, that there's different types of CISOs that are needed for different types of organization. Right. As you look at the organizational maturity that from the inception, the understanding that we need a security program to building it, to maturing it, to now just operationalizing it, those are different personas of people. Mm -hmm. So I would say that as you're upfront trying to help 
the organization understand the importance of security and that it's not just a sub IT function of a bunch of gremlins in the basement, kind of not being seen, just hammering away on keyboards. Uh, that takes, I say, I think that takes less technical. That is more of a people skill, understanding it's really, it's a listening skill, right? It's, it's understanding the business, the drivers and all of that and mapping it to, I understand where the business is going now. Here's the risk that you may not be thinking about. Uh, so by and large of people. Now, I think as you get into some of the, the mid building phases and some of that, I think it helps to have some of the technical acumen, but I don't think that it's, it's a necessary. I think we can point to a lot of good leaders around us that understand what their limitations are. And if the technical capability is not one of your strengths, that you are bringing somebody in that can offset that, that has that technical strength. I, I think so that, I guess the short answer of it is no, it doesn't have to be a technical leader, but it has to be on somebody that understands what they don't know and the willing to have the humility to bring in the right people to offset that. So which comes first in smaller organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, in smaller organizations where you're hiring, uh, there's been some changes coming up or there are some changes coming up from the SEC and the Federal Trade Commission in the US mm -hmm. that are gonna require specific skill sets and named employees regarding security within organizations. Not all those organizations are ready to fill out multiple levels or can afford to fill out multiple levels. So which comes first, the technical or the business acumen in somebody doing that CISO role? Yeah, so knowing me, Dan, people process technology, I'm always gonna lead with people and processes yep. first. Uh, if you can't figure out those aspects, it doesn't matter what technology you layer on, you missed it. Yeah, yeah, you'll have a tech that nobody knows how to run or, or what comes out of it. Shelfware. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> so I'm gonna jump in real quick. Um, I know that all of the CISOs that I've met love attorneys. What do you think the opportunities are going forward for people in legal, compliance, ethics, privacy, risk, to be collaborating more closely with information security? And where do you think there are like gaps or hip gaps along the way? Hip gaps? Yeah, I think I, I think I think the gaps and hiccups, I think, are are those that think they are distinctly separate verticals that they don't need to be collaborating. Everything we do now is, is a conversation across business functions. Um, certainly depending on the vertical, different businesses are in the ramifications of security and possibly a product that you're going to market. Uh, that's, that's a very real conversation to have with the legal team, certainly around, and uh, you mentioned compliance is, is huge. Um, now in manufacturing, maybe a little bit different because you really don't have anything at the, the federal level uh, until you start getting into to trade and some of those things. Um, but certainly, you know, as I think about it, everything we do has some type of legal tie back to can we do this activity? Should we do this activity? And then on the heels of that, once you answer those questions, that's where you have to have compliance in the room as well as understanding, all right, are we still in the guardrails? Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Have you ever thought about a JD as the next step for a CISO? Uh, I, I think it's a natural progression. Um, I, I absolutely do. I mean, it's, I think having both of those acumen, that's dangerous, that's powerful. Um, have I personally thought about it? It's the royal I, you. <laughs> so... <laughs> this guy. Uh, so the answer is yes. So I was looking at it for a short stint. I've actually got a couple of neighbors that are lawyers and actually got talked out of it. And, and the whole concept was, well, it's not just security law, contract law, you got to learn, you got to go through the full gamut of it, which mm -hmm. understandably, um, I actually decided I'm going to go a different direction and going the, the more generalist route on the MBA side to broaden kind of exposure across the business and make the attachments there. Uh, but who knows? A JD could be on the heels of that. I tend to like school and learning. So who knows what the future holds? So all those things are about continuing to enrich your capabilities. One of the things that really uh, that this field struggles with across compliance, security, risk, ethics, governance as well is imposter syndrome is a lot of people feeling like they don't necessarily belong because it isn't a defined path or track. So how do you how do you keep yourself? Uh, out of that morass, and how, how, how do you help other people 
get their heads in the right space around imposter syndrome in the field. Yeah, there's a lot of conversations around that. I, <laughs> I, I would say there's probably not a day that goes by where some component of that doesn't enter in. That if you just look at the vastness of what we still want to accomplish, the tasks on the list that you, know, you remove one task list, 10 more got added. That's just kind of the nature of what we do. I think it naturally starts to gravitate towards that conversation, that little voice in your head that's going, well, how come you couldn't do all of those things? Are you not the right person? Could you not do it? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of it for me, what I found is understanding when to check out and kind of rebuild right? So, you know, for me personally, I, I like to go for, I'll go for a couple mile walk and listen to an audio book, something completely unrelated just to disconnect. Um, but then I think there's a whole element of relying on family as well and friends and having those, those outlets to talk to. So you know, we talk a lot about the community around us and reaching out and connecting. I think that's where it becomes really important so that you don't get into that kind of self-fulfilling cycle of just getting down on yourself that, you know, you're not enough. Yeah, it's, it's dangerous. And I think in the, the context of the team, it's being cognizant of that, that, you know, it's not too hard to fathom that if I struggle with it on a daily, weekly basis, that that's not unique to me, that everybody's going through some component of it. So it's making sure having those conversations, checking in with the, with the team to, to see what's going on. Um, it, it can be dangerous. You know, if you, you think about put that in the context of what we've all been through with COVID and going through isolation, that you put somebody in isolation for a long enough period and it's just them in their head, things you can, you can create some, some interesting narratives pretty quickly and need to make sure that the team is well positioned. And I, you know, I think it comes back to as well as, as checking out and making sure, again, back to those boundaries vacation times being taken that people are checking out it's mental health is a huge huge aspect that's got to be focused on his reason for saying that is twofold one because it's true and two to remind me to actually take a vacation yep <laughs> it's important it, oh it absolutely is um and that headspace is, is you know like you said that's, more important now than ever i mean you think about it think about it outside of our space right look at lynn lynn manuel miranda you know, if we look at one of the, the greatest plays now with Hamilton, why? Because he forced himself to check out, he read a book and look what we got. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. The power of checking out and disconnecting with today is so powerful. So you mentioned audiobook, best audiobook. Ooh, that is a, that is a good question. All right. So I'll go back to probably the first one that got me in reading nonstop was, um, Marshall Goldsmith. What got you here? Won't get you there. Um, that is by far one of my favorites that actually I was just talking to my wife about it the other day and was looking back at how long ago it was that I read that book and need to go back and reread read it. Cause every time you read it, you get something new from it. It's got some other application to where you are in your life. Um, so that's, that, I would say that's probably my favorite one right now. Excellent. Nice. It's a great book. The, the, other, the other side of this, so now that we've painted this beautiful picture of, of stressful life, running toward fires, um, burnout, and imposter syndrome, we have this huge need at the other end of the funnel for more people coming into the field. Um, and this is, this is due to a number of different factors, poor hiring practices, um, issues with historical issues within the security field and, and you know, non-white male people wanting to enter, giving in a good environment for that. Um, but also how to get, you know, how to get your foot in the door has been a challenge. So when someone asks you, Eric, how do I get started in security? What is the advice you give them? Yeah. I, so the, the first one I like to draw back to this is number one is, and this is something I had to learn early in my career, the power of networking. Um, no matter what, there's, you have to have a support group around you. And that may not just be to bounce questions off of, but it may be where you find your next job or just to provide you some advice on, hey, I want to get into this part of security and these type of companies are looking for X, right? Because I mean, again, to, you know, Dan's line, it depends on where you're trying to go with within security. Um, that, you know, you have some organizations that are very heavy looking at certifications, 
others want the you know 10 years 16 years in kubernetes and and all of that which gets into a whole different discussion the unicorn around, well, no things <laughs> right, that aren't right. actually feasible because they haven't been around as long as the job descriptions say that you need to have been using them yeah it's it absolutely insane this this job requires time travel <laughs> right there was a there, but i think it, yeah, there was a joke I think, post yeah. the other day um with a kid a guy sitting there with his baby in a shoulder in a shoulder holster and says i've got to guess start getting this kid the 20 years experience necessary <laughs> for an entry level security job <laughs> and it's unfortunate and wrong but but it's a real problem that we face in the hiring process today yeah. And I, I mean, to draw the bag, I think part of that is what you mentioned, Dan, that, that we've from a security community, the focus on it, the frameworks we have, we've come a long way from where it once was, but we still have so far to go in defining what it means to have a good security program. You know, and I, I think a lot of that, that we see that play out in the, the hiring practices, that where should we set the bar? What should somebody know? Um, and unfortunately, I think we miss a lot of good candidates you know, years ago, I was talking to some individuals from a fairly large managed security provider that were starting to go after number one, high schoolers, uh, but also tangential fields. So they were going after lawyers that were starting to retire. They were going after different fields, recognizing that it's not necessarily what you know in security. It's as long as you have a certain level of curiosity that what we need is an abundance of perspectives in the way that we're looking at how we're doing things to challenge the norms of how we're doing security today. And I, I think we, we've still got a ways to go in helping that understand and helping that flow into the hiring practices on who should be joining the programs. Um, they, Google recognizes, this, right? So if you look at Google, they recognize that the amount of effort it would take to take a security practitioner and make them into a developer to understand that is far more than taking a developer and making them, helping them understand some tenets of security. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to have some of those, those same mindsets within security that we've got to let go of these, these find this guy kind of certification requirements and, and realize that what we need to focus in the personality, who the person is, everything else, we can teach those aspects. So yeah, last I've... question before we get to the ultimate question, um, <laughs> um, life, the universe and everything. But, uh, but first, the, just a, a, there's all this focus on offensive security, on attack methods, on capturing the flag, which comes first. I get back to the which comes first questions. You know, where would you, which is more important for a good quality security practitioner these days to focus on the offensive side, which is really sexy and out there a lot, or the defensive side, which is much more nuanced and not nearly as flashy. Yes. So, so I heard somebody, I heard the phrase throughout an offensively informed defense. And I really, really like that phrase. Cause think about it, that if you focus on just one of the two aspects, you miss, you're missing something, right? If you focus just on defense, then you don't understand the real world applicability of how you are going to be attacked, who the, the attackers are, what are the techniques that they're using. And it doesn't, many times, doesn't matter what controls you put in place if that is, does not map to how you're gonna be attacked, right? you kind of miss the ball. And at the same time, we've always looked at, you know, you know, Dan, you and I have, have kind of come up on the blue team, right? And we look at a lot of those red teamers that after an engagement and you're going, have you really worked in an enterprise at all? Like the understanding of, well, just go put in all of these controls. No, no, no. There's business that actually has to run on this side, right? So I, I think it's somewhere in the middle. Well, hence the rise of the team. Yes, from an engagement standpoint. But I think that's having that mindset on the team is important as well. On the understanding of kind of the, how are you going to be attacked? But also having that, that more traditional enterprise IT, bigger picture scalability, uh, that understanding on the team as well. Wow. Well, this has been such a fun conversation. I know that we are kind of reaching the end of our time. So I wanted to ask the classic mentor core question. What's the best advice you've ever- As opposed to ever... the question with the new styling. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so what's the best advice you've ever received from a mentor or alternatively, What's the best advice you've ever given a mentor or a mentee, I should say? 
Yeah, I think the best re- advice that I've ever received was, would probably be the never think you're done learning. That as, as soon as you that thought comes into your mind, it might be time to check out um, because it doesn't matter what field you're in, we don't know it all. It's continually learning, it's continually changing. And part of that is have an attitude of curiosity. <clears throat> Always be challenging what, you, what you've done in the past, what you should be doing, and just continually connecting because there's multiple viewpoints out there on how you can do it. Fantastic. One might even call that an advertisement for liberal arts education right there. <laughs> <laughs> <Could be. Right. laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Eric. I really appreciate you sharing your insights and your, uh, and your experiences. Uh, and thanks to you, the listener. Thanks for being here for another Magic Call. We really appreciate you being here as well. Please let us know if you have any feedback. Uh, You can get us at uh, info at mentorcore.biz or you can find us on our website, mentorcore.biz. And all of these are available on both audio and video versions. The audio versions are on podcast.mentorcore.biz or your favorite podcast application, just search for Mentorcore. Or you can find us on YouTube by searching for Mentorcore. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next Mentorcore.